be seated. I'd like to begin by saying thank you for being here today, the friends, especially your support for the family during this time. And uh, we come together in the presence of the Lord and with joy and knowing that he is always with us and able to meet every need that we have. So let's look to him in prayer and ask for his guidance and that he would be glorified in this service. Our Father, we thank you for your love to us. Thank you for your son that you gave for us. Thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ who provides for us the salvation that gives us hope. And we thank you today for the blessing of the life of Gerald Hanna and for all that he has been to each of us in individual ways. Collectively, we have lost a great friend and a brother in Christ. Today, I pray for your comfort to be with this family. And as we begin this service, we invite your presence. We pray for your guidance. We pray for your spirit. And we pray for your love to be continually manifested in behalf of Miss Judy and Will and the rest of the family. And we'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs> This world of sorrow Sometime before you do Just look for me in heaven And we'll talk
Will call me. I just found out about Gerald and asked me would I participate in this service. Gerald and I had sort of a, an agreement. Whichever one went first, I said, would you speak at mine? And so it turned out as it is, and Judy told me, he said, well, you better off because I, he's not a very good speaker. So anyway, I'm very honored to be here, and I want you to know that this family means a lot to me. When I first went to work for the sheriff's office as a chaplain there, I got a call, and they told me that Gerald Hanna was in the hospital. And so I'd go down to the hospital, and I'd see Gerald, and Miss Judy was always there by his side. By his side. And I'd, I'd look at him, and he'd had all these, all these things hooked up to him, and I said, this doesn't look good. I don't know whether he's going to make it or not. Two days later, he walks out of the hospital. And, you know, I'd get another call a little bit later, and he'd be back in the hospital several months at a time. But I'd go always go see him because when I meet somebody, I look at the character of that person. I try to find out where he stands spiritually. And I knew right off the bat when I met Gerald Hanna, and I'd already met Gerald before, but I didn't know anything about the character of the person. He was a character now in his day. But um, what I'm talking about is where he stood with the Lord. And I found out very quickly where he stood with the Lord. Because we, we fell on common ground. And as you know, Paul wrote about that common ground in 1 Corinthians. And I knew by, when I called Gerald on his phone, I got amazing grace. And one of the reasons I'd called him because I wanted to hear amazing grace. But I wanted to talk to Gerald at the same time. But he had a special place in my heart. And, um, you know, Miss Judy, 58 years is a lifetime for some people. 58 years. Um, that's a really an accomplishment. And I, I hope the young people and others that are married can strive for that. Um, I went to, to see Gerald every, every time. Just every time I knew he was in the hospital, I'd go see him. Between him and Wayne Howard, they kept me in the hospital, if you know Wayne Howard. But um, the one thing that I was impressed about most of all was the commitment of Miss Judy. She was always there by, him, by his side. She stayed in the room 24-7. And she was always there. At one point in their, in their lives, between hospitals with him, she needed some things fixed on her, a knee replacement. Or I can vaguely remember that, but I refreshed my memory with Will yesterday. I went to see her in the hospital, and to my surprise, she was in a room. She was walking around. I thought if you had your knee replaced, it took a couple of days, but they had her up and walking. So she said, well, the minister just left here, and I said, well, that's fine, but I came to see you and to have a word of prayer with you. And as soon as I said that, all the ladies in that room, they were, the most, they were all ladies, weren't they, Miss Judy? I think you, it was the ladies' floor. They all came in there too. They wanted prayer too. And so, you know, it was that type of environment and that type of atmosphere and that type of relationship that I had with Gerald and his family. Gerald would come out to the sheriff's office and he would visit from time to time and he'd always come by my office to see me. And he'd go through the other offices throughout the sheriff's office and he wanted to spend some time with them and his heart was doing law enforcement as you've already seen 53 years of it, I think. Is that right? 53. And most of the 
everybody that uh, in this community knew him because he led funerals. Uh, among other things, he was a reserve officer and he came to the assistance of other officers. But he had a heart for that. But Gerald was a fighter. He never gave up. He was determined to overcome whatever difficulty he had. I would call him from time to time and he wouldn't answer and I'd get amazing grace and I was satisfied with that. But uh, he would tell me, he said, well, I'm, I've been um, at the dialysis. And I, I, I think it was almost an everyday thing, wasn't it, Miss Judy? Three days? Okay. Well, it seemed like to me it was all every time I called him. But anyway, um, but, but the thing again that impressed me was that his wife was always by, him, by his side. And I remember there was, there was a country song, and I know Gerald liked country songs, Stand By Your Man. And she stood by him, come thick or thin, she was always there. Gerald ran the race of life as hard as he could run it. I can remember when I was on the track team in high school and I ran a race. The coach said, finish the race. Whatever you do, finish the race. I don't know where I finished, but I wasn't in the top four. I promise you that. But I finished the race. And Gerald ran the race of life. He ran it hard as well as gave it all that he had. And he gave it all to his family, too. I could see that in his lifestyle. Paul wrote in Philippians 3.14, I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God through Jesus Christ is calling us. Gerald pressed on and he received that, that prize, that heavenly prize on December the 17th. In 2 Timothy, Paul writes Timothy and says, I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race and have remained faithful. John wrote in Revelation 21, 4 about the new heaven and the earth. And John said, And God will wipe away every tear. There will be no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. There'll be no more dialysis machines. On December the 17th, Gerald Morgan Hanna was in heaven, walking the golden streets of heaven of the New Jerusalem in the presence of Jesus Christ and along with his son and his loved ones, his mother and his father, that quick, in a flick of an eye, he was in heaven. When he left here, I know where he is, and I'll join him one day. And I, I think we need to ask ourselves, will we ever see Gerald Hanna again? We will if we believe that Jesus Christ is our, as a, take Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. I think if you were to ask Gerald in his closing moments what would be the last things that he would say or say to us if he could come back and tell us something right now. And that comes from Philippians 4.4. 4. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again I say rejoice. Let your gladness be known to all men because the Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything with prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, 
will guard your hearts and your souls through Jesus Christ. I look at the life of Gerald Hanna and my friend and my Conrad, and I know when he stepped from across the line on December the 17th, Jesus looked at him and he said, Well done, my good and faithful servant. Amen. sins were as scarlet till Jesus came. He washed them whiter than snow. Now I find my delight in his lovely name. His joy is the strength of my soul. song my wife just sang uh, 
was Gerald's song. Ever since uh, 1986, when I first went to Westside Freewell Baptist Church in Johnsonville, stayed there for 25 years plus a few months. Gerald Hanna was a uh, part of my life and a good part. I first came to know Gerald in 1986, and I actually came to know him or know more about him than he probably wanted me to know through Miss Willis Snow, his mother. In fact, uh, Miss Willis Snow Hanna sort of uh, filled me in on all of you for several years before I actually got to know them very well. And uh, those were some wonderful days with uh, Miss Willis Snow. And one of the things that she was very concerned about was the spiritual well-being of her children. And uh, in those visits with her, there were quite a few stories about Gerald and Stanley. And uh, occasionally, Pansy would be in part of the picture, but most of the time it was Gerald and, and Stanley. He was, uh, as Brother Rainwater has already said, he was a character. That's putting it very lightly. <laughs> he was quite a fella. And uh, I'm sort of glad that Gerald has given me the last word because he was notorious at doing the very best he could to get your goat. And especially if he could embarrass you in front of somebody, the, the more uh, you lost your dignity, the, the greater it made him feel. I can see him now just grabbing his nose and hiding his grin and just laughing and his face turning red. And that was the kind of person he was. He was a jokester and he loved life. He loved having fun and he was a great friend. Always a trickster, always had some, some little devious scheme going on in his mind. And uh, in fact, just this morning as we were in service, Brother Rhett Floyd sends his greetings and condolences, by the way, Miss Judy and Will and the family. His dad used to pastor over at Westside uh, for about five years, but uh, Rhett was a teenager then and growing up. But as Gerald would do the... Uh, security at some of the ball games. It wasn't too long ago. It sometimes back, Gerald, uh, Red, Rhett was telling me, you know what I remember about uh, Gerald, he said, <clears throat> it wasn't too long ago we were over at Johnsonville with uh, East Clarendon, which is where Rhett teaches. And he said we were there and um, had East Clarendon playing the golden, the flashes. And uh, anyway, the next morning when I went to school, it was, um, one of the students from East Clarendon, the team, came over to me and said, Mr. Red, I met your daddy last night. <laughs> <laughs> and Red said, oh, it wasn't my daddy. My daddy's been dead for quite a few years. Well, he said he was your daddy. <laughs> so Gerald had introduced himself <laughs> as a... Uh, Rhett's daddy when uh, so this you know that's the kind of guy he was there I mean we could go over and over again of those uh, those ta you know stories uh, Judy I don't know if you remembered or not and I've and I prayed about this I've debated on whether or not to even use this but now I've <clears throat> since he took no mercy on me I'm not going to take any mercy on him I remember those hospital visits and uh there was one occasion <clears throat> where I'm not real sure what the procedure was. It may have been a kidney stone or, or something of that nature. Um, I'm not sure had, what it had to do with. But uh, anyway, Gerald was telling me, he said, man, you gotta, you got to hear this story. I said, what are you talking about? He said, I got the best of one of these nurses. Came in here and uh, she asked me if there's anything I needed. And I, he looked at her. Lifted up his covers and looked down, looked back up. He said, you got any fix a flat? <laughs> so, <laughs> and that was the kind of guy he was. He was just, you know, I mean, and uh, he was on and on with stuff like that all the time. So uh, today's my day to get him back. One of the uh, ball games at Johnsonville, as he was serving um, as a security officer, I was standing up there with him and... <clears throat> He always called me his rabbi, and uh, Miss um, 
Lundy, I believe her name was, I think it was Becky Lundy, was the principal in an elementary school. And she walks in, and I'm standing up by Gerald. And he said, Miss Lundy, this is my rabbi. And she looks at me with a little bit of a stern look. I, I guess she was looking for my hat. I'm not real sure. But then she looks back at Gerald, and she said, he is not a rabbi. Oh, yeah, he's my rabbi. He is not a rabbi. I, and then she pulls out this necklace and says, you see this star? This is the Star of David. And it turns out that Miss Lundy was a Jew. I mean, a real Jew. She was, she was in, in the Jewish faith. And of course, you know, I would have never have offended. I, <laughs> Gerald bit off more than he could chew that day. <laughs> Because he started, she started going at him, and uh, she said, if you want he, and to put all of that in even a worst case scenario, when she, she did this Star of David thing, Gerald points to his badge, he said, well, I got a star too. <laughs> and I'm going, Lord, please give me a place to hide, get out of this, you know. But uh, by the time she finished with him, he was red faced, and, and I'm not so sure he was doing all that much laughing. I looked, I looked at him after she walked off. I said, man, you are crazy. And he just grinned. Problem with that, about three, three weeks later, I saw Miss Lundy, and, uh, man, I can't even describe the look she gave me, and I didn't have anything to do with any of that. But that's where Gerald would go with stuff like that. Uh, he was a good civil servant. I can't even tell you the many times that uh, he led us in those funeral processions and... Uh, like Brother Rainwater said, he took, he took a lot of pride in his work. He was a very, very good civil servant, and uh, he was a good friend. He was, he was very good at what he did, and I appreciated him very much. This song that I mentioned uh, became one of the favorites that Camille sang at many of the funerals, and uh, that was one of his requests every time. Anytime she didn't sing it at a funeral by the family's request, he would always catch her at the door and say, you didn't sing my song today, make sure you sing my song at my funeral. I don't know how many times he said that, so I'm glad we were able to do this and uh, be with you today for Gerald. He always was a very loving father. He loved his boys, and he, he made manifest of that quite a few times, and uh, Gerald had a serious side, and I appreciated that because when he would put all jokes aside, he and I had some very good conversations about the Lord and uh, especially about needs. He loved Miss Judy. He loved Jerry and Will, and he, he was very, very grateful for his family and his in-laws. As I think about him being a loving father and a devoted husband, I, I certainly am thankful for those, and I know we all are. But more than anything else, I'm glad he was a faithful servant of the Lord. He served his Lord, and he served him well. And he was very serious about his faith, and he trusted in the Lord. So with that in mind, I'd like to just share with you what I feel like he would want me to share with you from the scriptures, the reality of the hope that we do have in the Lord Jesus Christ. And that hope is found on a lot of, in a lot of verses, but uh, one of our favorites that we've shared, um, and Gerald and I talked about one time, was 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, and verse 13 through 18. You're very familiar with it if you've been at very many funerals, which is used quite a bit. One of my favorite passages speaks of the rapture. In verse 13, Paul writes, he says, But I would not have you ignorant, brethren, concerning those which are asleep, those who have died, that ye sorrow not even as others which have no hope. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so them also which sleep in Jesus will God bring with him. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we which are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord shall not prevent them which are asleep. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout and with the voice of the archangel and with the trump of God. And the dead in Christ shall rise first, then we which are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so shall we ever be with the Lord. Wherefore, comfort one another with these words. The joy of these verses is in the introduction where Paul says, 
I would not have you ignorant concerning those who have died in the faith, that you sorrow not as others who have no hope. He didn't say don't sorrow. I mean, you're going to miss Gerald. We're going to miss him. And pain is part of death. I mean, there's no way getting beyond that. But there is hope, and there is a joy that is because of that hope the Lord brings to us. And, and Paul just describes this for us. He says, first of all, there is the resurrection of the church, those who are the, the body of Christ, those who have put their faith in him. And that resurrection is so important. I think Paul spends uh, an entire chapter, verse 58 verses in 1 Corinthians 15 about the resurrection and what it means. And the confirmation of the resurrection is ours because Jesus himself was resurrected. And he goes at great length to say over 400, 500 witnesses at one time saw Jesus after he was alive. He spent 40 days after the resurrection with his disciples talking about the kingdom of God. There was absolutely no doubt whatsoever that Jesus had been resurrected from the dead. Paul goes on to say in 1 Corinthians 15 that is, that is our confirmation. If the dead in Christ, if, if Christ died, we died in Christ, we also shall live. The resurrection himself, Jesus becomes that resurrection. He speaks of that in Romans and other places. So the confidence that we have of the resurrection even so, as Paul says in Romans, in, Christ, in, in, Adam, in Adam we die, even so in Christ we shall all be made alive. So the resurrection was very important. It brings to us a great consolation. And second thing that I see in this verse that I often reflect over and really glad is the fact that there is a reunion. You'll notice that Paul said in this passage that those who have died in faith are presently with the Lord and the Lord will bring with him those who have died in the faith. Paul puts it quite a few places uh, where it's very clear, but he says to depart from this body is to be present with the Lord. He says for me to, to live is Christ, but to die is gain. And he think about that, he says, I'm in a strait between two. To stay here uh, was more needful, but I long to go home and be with the Lord. So we know that there is a paradise, there is a peace, there's a bliss that Gerald is experiencing right now. He is with the Lord, but when he comes back, the Lord returns, we know that he will come again. Those who are with the Lord in soul and spirit, Christ will bring back with him when he comes back. But as uh, Brother Mike has sung to us, one of the greatest joys is not just the resurrection of the church, and we'll have a resurrection body and a new body and not just the, rea the, uh, the reality of a reunion with all Christians who've died in the faith. But there is also the return of Christ, the very one that becomes our savior. He is our hero and he's the one we long to see. He's the one that we want to see. So the hope of life forever in a perfect environment comes because of Christ and it will happen when he returns, the hope of a glorified resurrection body and the glorification that comes to us because of him. And then there is the, the reunion and the consolation of being with everyone that is a Christian and with believers and with the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the hope that we have in Christ Jesus. As Brother Rainwater has already said, and I think it's aptly put, that uh, the most important decision that we can make is to decide to trust Jesus Christ as our personal Savior, to become his disciple and live for him. That doesn't mean we are going to be perfect because we can't be perfect, but we are given the perfection of Christ through his righteousness as a gift. And then as a result of his spirit in us, we live for him and obey him and strive to please him. So if you're here today and you're not prepared for this moment, it's coming to all of us. And the challenge that I could hear Gerald share with you is, Whatever you do, make sure you trust the Lord. Make sure you put your faith in him. He loved his Savior, and he served him well. Let us pray together. Heavenly Father, I do ask you to continue to be with us. I, I especially thank you for this family and for the joy of the years that we were able to spend together. And I thank you for the fellowship and the sweetness of your spirit in us and the the joy of what it means to have friends and people that you can call on at any moment's notice and know that they, they're there and they will help you. And this was who Gerald was to us, and I thank you for that. But most of all today, I thank you for this hope 
that I've spoken of that Gerald lived in, the hope of being with you, and he is now in your presence. And we look forward to seeing him again, but most of all, we look forward to seeing you. So be with us, and I pray for this family, and I pray for your strength to be with them. And as we close out this service and we go to the, the gravesite and say our final goodbyes in our hearts, I just ask for your, your grace and the power of your strength. And I thank you for all that you do in Jesus' name. Amen. I ask everyone except the immediate family uh, to rise at this time. There is coming a day when the heart it shall come. No more clouds in the sky and no more tears will dim the eye. All is